Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. Today's video is ostensibly about a classic dungeon and cavern dweller that may be found under the dense canopy of a rainforest or the sort of dark and enchanted old woods with giant trees that can be found in Dungeons and Dragons worlds. I'll also expand on the ecology a lot, um, talk about the exotic environments as well. Today we're talking about the Shrieker and other Underdark fungus, but also a bit about the Underdark itself, including some interesting perspectives of those who dwell there. In the Underdark, the fungus life is incredibly diverse and rich. It forms all the type of environments that plants create on the surface world, including the sort of vegetation found in bodies of water. Actually, the line between land and water is frequently blurred in the Underdark, but there are certainly are seas and the equivalent of deserts also. Actually, to the denizens of the middle and deep Underdark, the upper Underdark is a lot like a cold, inhospitable place with extremes of dry or wet conditions. Also, it's subject to the mysterious thing they have on the surface world called weather. From the perspective of a being native to the Underdark, such as a drow, the upper Underdark is like climbing the alpine region of a mountain. The main settlements that you find there are those who delve down from the surface, not those who delve upward from the deep Underdark, for the simple reason that it's easier to grow food on the surface and take it down into the caverns. Also, the protection offered by the underground terrain the people of the lower regions already have, so there's little point on tr to uh, trekking all the way up there unless they intend to have dwellings with the uh, dealings with the surface world. There is plenty of resources in the deep and middle upper uh, underdark, full and bountiful alien ecosystems that thrive on the rich minerals, geothermal heat, and the exotic phase rest energy. I should take a moment to talk about phase rest and where it came from, because I've mentioned this before, since it's unique to the world of Toril and plays a critically important role in the ecology of the Underdark. Phase rest was created by Elven High Magic when the Drow retreated to the Underdark so they could escape by, um, by magical means. They, they, they can't escape by magical means, I should say. The ancient Dark Elven nation of Ilithir was destroyed when Coralyn Larathian, patron god of the elven race, acted through priests and high elven mages. Remember, at this early time in history, spells higher than level 9 were still able to be cast. Uh, they magically transformed all the dark elves, good and bad, into the drow, ending the nation of Ilithia and the Ilithiri nation. Um, well, the, the people of Ilithia and the Ilithiri nation. It was uh, kind of unfair in many cases. At the same time, creating the phase rest energy of the Underdark. So the ecologies of the Underdark have evolved from that point. In minus 10,000 DR, a mere 11,491 years ago. All things considered, this is not a very long time. Also consider the oldest civilizations of Ableth, Troglodytes, Naga, Giants, Dragons and so on. The Underdark would have been a much different, much more inhospitable place back then, with a greatly reduced, much more predatory ecosystem, sparsely populated and very dangerous. Since the Underdark lacked food or light for plant life and fungi, many plants and fungi are now living, uh, now thriving underground. From, they're those that found a way to, to live on a diet of the phase rest energy. This is a magical energy source. These fungi and plants therefore don't follow the same rules as plants and fungus we are more familiar with. Hands in the air and just say um, it's magic because magic. So literally that's the case in the Underdark of uh, Toril. Some areas are much stronger in this energy than others, uh, kind of like ley line activity. The drow settlements are located in areas rich with it which makes uh, teleportation magic wildly unpredictable and also messes with divination and conjuration spells. However, it can be channeled into physical objects and ob uh, accumulate in living cells. It also creates light, um, motive force, and can spark co consciousness in all sorts of life forms. There's also an abundance of fey energy in the fey dark portals dotting the landscape of the Underdark, and deep below, the border between reality and the far realms is, in places, dangerously thin. Just as a side note of interest, the first dwarven settlements started appearing in the Yehimel Mountains in the far eastern border of Faerun in minus 16,000 DR. From there, the dwarves began to migrate into Faerun, Karatur, and Sakara. So they have a different racial mindset about where the old world is for their people. What most humans would call the far eastern edge of their known world, 
um, the dwarves call the the old center of their empire. Since most humans on the continent of Faerun are largely ignorant of how large, well developed, and populous the powerful nations of Karatur actually are, um, they think they're kind of the center of things. Anyway. There is a full range of the environments you would find on the surface world, and quite a lot that are unique to the middle and deep underdark. Quite a lot of the species and varieties of fungus and animal that you find in these environments, these biomes of different climate, terrain and growth types, are localised. They don't range very far, far from where they are highly adapted to. Most of these niches, uh, these niche areas, are pretty benign. You can travel through them without much more trouble than you would find in a tropical rainforest. When you trek through a rainforest, your primary concerns are likely to be, to be the same. Uh, don't get lost. Have some clean water with you. Equip yourself for the conditions and go carefully rather than quickly. Often the things that potentially hurt your character in those areas were not deliberately doing so deliberately. They just happen to have spines, toxins, acids, or slimes. They just happen to grow like a trapdoor over a gaping chasm, or constrict and grapple, or choke and constrict anyone who moves through them. These places will be riots of unusual life forms not seen anywhere else, but none of them are as specialized for hunting player characters from the surface world, because it's so rare to find such creatures roaming around in the Underdark. The dwarves and the drow, troglodytes and grimlocks, kobolds, sniff nevlum, uh, dwaga, illithids, they're all well adapted to this ecosystem and tend to have ways of dealing with mists of toxic spores or pools of acid, lakes of mud, scorching geothermal geysers, um, all the species of animals that are very exotic to surface dwellers but are just normal to them. They'll be just like plucking things off fungus and, and munching them as they go, um, whereas humans just wouldn't have any idea what to eat or what to drink. Um, yeah, so it's just normal. You can use base stats for surface creatures and give them a variety of underdark traits, um, like a template such as blind sense, the ability to climb and swim, bioluminescence, immunity to fungus spores, resistance to toxins, dark vision, so on, you know. There are far more life forms in the Underdark than are found in the pages of any monster manual, far more than all of the creatures in all of the monster manuals combined. There are centipedes like pythons, it's moths as large as bats, uh, cave grung, wolf worms, mud quippers, gark yeti, gala dure, burrow slugs, uh, ascomoids, giant cave wetter, as well as the interesting fungus varieties that are mentioned in, in the Rage of Demons um, source book. Well, actually, let's take a look at them. So we've got the barrel stalk, it's a large cask shaped fungus that can be tapped and drained for fresh water, which is stored within it. A single barrel stalk contains 1d4 plus 4 gallons of water and yields 1d6 plus 4 pounds of food. That's interesting. Dubbed the grain of the underdark, a blue cap is inedible but its spores can be ground into a nutritious bland flour. Uh, bread made from blue cap, flour, blue, cap, blue cap flour is known as spore bread or blue bread. One loaf is equivalent to one pound of food. Pale orange, white in colour, fire lichen, thrives on warmth, so it grows in regions of geothermal heat. Fire lichen can be ground and fermented into a hot spicy paste, which is spread on spore bread or added to soups or stews to flavour them. And Dwaygar also ferment fire lichen into a fiercely hot liqueur. So you can imagine that um, you would have something like a cave wetter roasted um, leg meat, um, which would be the equivalent of something like a, um, a very soft and tender juicy um, turkey meat with this uh, pale orange white fire lichen sauce spread over top of it, this paste. Um, so yeah, you could have like a shish kebab. Ripple bark is a shelf life like fungus that resembles a mass of rotting flesh. It's surprisingly edible actually and though it can be eaten raw it tastes much better roasted and obviously looks a lot better roasted. A single sheet of ripple bark yields 1d4 plus 6 pounds of food. A trillamac is a mushroom that grows to a height of 4 or 5 feet and has broad grey green cap and light grey stalk. The cap's leathery surface can be cut and cleaned for use in making maps, hats, scrolls, um, maybe even a poncho. Its surface takes on dyes and inks well. The stalk can be cleaned, soaked and in water for an hour and then dried to make a palatable food akin to bread. Each trillamac stalk provides 1d6 plus 4 pounds of food. A water orb is a bulbous fungus that grows in shallow water. The mature water orb can be squeezed like a sponge yielding a gallon of drinkable water and a pound of edible if chewy and somewhat tasteless food. 
Zerk wood is a massive mushroom that can reach a height of 30 or 40 feet. Its large grain-like spores are edible and nutritionally equivalent to 1 4 plus 4 pounds of foods. But Zerk wood is more important for its hard and woody stalks. It's, the, it's basically the forest of the Underdark. The Zerk wood is one of the few sources of timber in the Underdark used for making furniture, containers, bridges and rafts, among other things. Of course, it's got a different texture. And skilled crafters can use stains, sanding and polishing to bring out different patterns in the Zerk wood. Of course, it's got a twisting mycelial pattern, not um, the ring-like growth of wood that you'd find in the surface world. The nightlight is a tall and tube-shaped bioluminescent mushroom that grows to a height of 1d6 plus 4 feet and emits bright light in a 15-foot radius and dim light for another 15 feet. A nightlight that is uprooted or destroyed goes dark after one round. If a living nightlight is, light is um, touched, either by a creature or an object, its light goes out until it's touched again. So clap on, clap off sort of thing. A Nilhog's nose is a small mushroom that grants any creature that eats it advantage on wisdom perception checks based on smell for 1d4 hours. However, the creature suffers from disadvantage on saving throws against um, effects based on smell for the same amount of time, obviously. A bioluminescent green moss that grows in warm and damp areas, Orumu, is particularly common near steam tunnels and vents, and it sheds dim light in a 5 foot radius and can be harvested, dried, and made into phosphorescent powder or pigment. Also known as the devil's mushroom, a, tin, a timask is a 2 foot tall toadstool with orange and red stripes across a beige cap. Uprooting or destroying the timask causes it to expel a 15 foot radius cloud of poisonous spores. Creatures in the area must say, succeed on a DC-14 constitution saving throw or be poisoned. While poisoned in this way, the creature is under the effect of a confusion spell with a duration of one minute. When the effect ends, the poisoned condition also ends. And it's uh, important to note that this would be a relatively common sort of a event when you're traveling through a, um, a fungus forest, unless you have some sort of a covering of your mouth, you're most likely to get hit with some sort of mind-altering effect at some point. Tongue of Madness is an edible fungus that looks somewhat like a large human tongue, believe it or not. A creature that eats a tongue of madness must succeed on a DC-12 constitution saving throw or compulsively speak aloud its every thought for the next hour. Obviously this is role-playing gold. The effect can be ended with a lesser restoration spell or similar magic. Uh, lesser restoration or greater restoration spells um, heal and um, obviously a wish spell is something I would certainly stock up with me if I was traveling down to the uh, Underdark. A one, oh, and of course, remove disease, very important spell to have with you. A one or two foot tall mushroom with a combustible cap, a torch stalk, burns for 24 hours once lit. So obviously it's got some sort of fibrous fatty substance to it. Uh, waxy, I should say. There is a one in six chance that these torch stalk explodes when lit, bursting into a cloud of fiery spores. Creatures within 10 feet of an exploding torch stalk take 3 um, or 1d6 of fire damage. So obviously um, it would take a little bit of underdark skill to discern when not to light that particular torch stalk. So very interesting. I imagine that you could take most things that can be fashioned and crafted on the surface world and that would be there would be some underdark, underdark equivalent to it somewhere. So yeah, fruits, vegetables, that sort of thing. I wonder what the underdark equivalent of a Brussels sprout would be. Now, the most famous and often wide-ranging fungus species, aside from the myconids, um, see my video on them for more detailed ecology of the fungus folk, are the violet fungus and the shrieker, and the gas spore. I'll talk more about gas spores some other time, but for now, the interesting relationship between the shrieker and the violet fungus. Um, as I mentioned, this isn't really covered in detail in the 5th edition Monster Manual. Uh, the stats of all of these two creatures are found there, though, if you want to come and check them out. A shrieker is a variety of violet fungus, known for its strange and loud noises it emits to attract prey. Shriekers are human-sized mushrooms. They are similar in appearance to violet fungus, but they lack the ability to move and do not have tentacles with which to poison prey. They can produce a loud piercing screaming sound that tends to attract curious creatures or adventurers to the area. They are immune to poison, um, the poisonous touch of a violet fungus. 
Shriekers thrive in dark underground environments. Besides being found in large numbers in the underdark, shriekers also grow on the floor of rainforests or similar dark and humid zones under very dense foliage and canopies that block the sunlight. There's probably also the equivalent of a marine ver- version of these two creatures as some sort of like a, a starfish or an anemone type of situation. Um, so sort of convergent re- um, evolution. So anywhere that blocks uh, significant amounts of sunlight um, can actually grow these mushrooms. Shriekers can sense nearby motion or light and will respond with their namesake shriek. Each such screaming sound lasts between 5 and 15 seconds. Um, A patch of shriekers relies on violet fungi to kill prey with their poison. Since a shrieker cannot attack or move on its own, like violet fungi, shriekers gain their nourishment from the breakdown of organic matter that has fallen nearby. So the perception that they shriek to ward off prey or to to send them away is actually a misconception. What they're trying to do is attract attention. Um, But they don't do this all the time because they want it to be a signal that um, will indicate that there's activity around them which will cue predators into rushing to the scene so that they can benefit from it straight away. In the Underdark, shriekers are sometimes placed intentionally to act as intruder alarms. The drow house De Vere planted a shrieker among every fifth mushroom surrounding its compound to ward off potential attackers, for instance. Shriekers, like the vilus fungus, are poisonous to most creatures as food. However, the stomachs of hook horrors have adapted to digest them without issue. So where you find shriekers and violet fungus, you are more likely to find hook horrors, which can subsist on them when there's no other prey around. Since they work fairly well together in a symbiotic relationship, since the hook horror is more than capable of creating many corpses for the fungus to thrive on. So shriekers are related to violet fungus, though there are a lot of differences between them. Both of them react to strong light and movement near them. Both digest primarily dead plants and animals. Both are very hardy. They can thrive in drier and colder environments than most other fungus in the Underdark. So they're very widely found in the Underdark at all levels. And also they usually work, um, they're found together. Though it seems that they're, they are distinct species and one is not a younger or more mature version of the other, nor is it a spore producing stage, life stage of the same organism. They just had a common ancestor several thousand years ago. Shriekers are a dull grey to milky white mushroom. They're about three foot tall and weigh about 35 pounds once fully grown. There are larger varieties though in ideal conditions. They can grow much larger. They have a stalk rooted into the cavern floor and exploratory tissue um, on the surrounding detritus. This mycelial mass is the sensitive trigger that sets off, off the motion sensor shrieking response. The caps have small holes in their tops that are covered with some kind of oily and stinky membrane. These holes uh, contain soft tissue not unlike vocal cords and can be used to produce the shriekers typical sounds. The shriekers are totally immune to the rotting enzymes that coat the violet fungus tentacles. They uh, Shriekers reproduce through spores, which waft through the air on the gentle flows that crisscross the underdark. Once the spores have found a favourable environment, a layer of nutrient-absorbing tissue is quickly formed in the suitable spot. From there, a shrieker mushroom will sl- um, start to slowly form. During growth, the stalk will secrete acids to anchor itself into the stone. So they, they create this characteristic pitted surface where they've, um, where they've settled. And that um, digested stone um, is turns into a sort of a, a goop that's um, used by other underdark creatures. Its spores are spread by either bombarding them away from the, um, strongly enough so that they launch through the air away from the shrieker, hopeful that they'll land far enough away to, or the um, spores um, may hitch a ride on migrating violet fungi and thereby moving the um, the colony of both mushroom types somewhere else. When the violet fungus dies, the shrieker fungus spores will often have a, um, a chance to start growing with a kickstart from the nutrients of the violet fungus decomposition. So it's, it's, it's definitely a, um, a beneficial situation for them. When something comes close, um, the mushroom contracts and starts shrieking. Uh, depending on how close the creature is and its dispos- disposition, it will either uh, move away from the viol- uh, from the shrieker or come in to investigate. In any case, nearby predators will likely kill the creature as it moves away. If the shrieker is located near a violet fungus colony, those will kill the prey if it comes near. And aside from all the shrieking, the violet uh, the shrieker doesn't really do much. It's um, a sedentary thing. Sedentary thing. 
It can host um, smaller creatures though, much like an anemone will host a crab or a small fish in the area um, in the sea. Shriekers can be home to small insects or other animals that have adopt, adapted to not set the things off and can handle the sticky membrane that covers them. The shrieker and violet fungus enjoy a symbiotic relationship. Aside from that, the shrieker is cultivated alongside the violet fungus for protection. Um, some underground creatures like shrieker meat and can act, uh, they can eat it gladly, but will um, either be immune to poison or they know how to remove all the spores um, before they eat it because it's the spores and spore producing mass which is the toxic part of the mushroom body. Unfortunately, the um, spore producing mass is dispersed through most of it, so um, it's actually very difficult, unless you know what you're doing, to eat a, uh, a shrieker because you'll, you'll get poisoned. It's uh, quite unpalatable as well, tough and too slimy for the pellets of most species, um, but it'll keep you filled. Some specialty shops shall sell shrieker spores held in a thick mixture of wheat paste and vermiculite, vermiculite in a small stone container. These can be planted in a dark and moist place to eventually grow into a shrieker colony. So um, they can be dispersed by intelligent species as well. I read a good idea when researching this one. If a druid or some wild magic effect winds up awakening the consciousness of a shrieker, they can learn how to speak and sing and would probably take their singing quite seriously. Um, it's basically the core of their being. Challenging those who have voices to a singing contest in exchange for information on the goings-on in their area. That could be quite a cute encounter. Uh, the violet, violet fungus is a well-known um, species to cave dwellers. They resemble giant mushrooms, ranging from light pink to a deep purple in colour. Their most distinctive and dangerous feature is their, uh, their venomous tentacles that can cause the rotting of almost any tissue they come in contact with, um, thanks to the, the coated in uh, these superactive enzymes. The typical violet fungus stands between 3 and 5 feet tall and weighs 40 to 65 pounds. The mushroom has a surprisingly resilient outer skin, somewhat wood-like in consistency, and uh, or like a thick leather, and many adventurers have been surprised at its toughness. At first glance, a violet fungus seems to be an extremely overgrown, pretty um, purple-coloured mushroom, but closer inspection will reveal its large tentacles coiled up and in an unexpanded resting state. Um, unless disturbed, if destroyed, these large tentacles will often grow, uh, regrow within a few days. And the foot itself of the fungus is a large muscled organ that um, sort of contracts and moves, used for soaking up nutrients and is capable of movement through, um, though it's not particularly fast, um, actually glacial, glacially slow. Compared to a myconid, I mean a myconid's much, much faster than a violet fungus, but they both get around. Aside from the large tentacles, there's a tangle of smaller tentacle filaments around the foot that are used to soak up nutrients. Um, they also move when this thing is moving around as well. Once a violet fungus has reached maturity and found a suitable feeding ground, it will try to catch some extra prey in preparation for releasing its spores. Once extra, tra extra uh, prey has been caught, it will release the spores into the surrounding area, at much lesser range than the shriekers do. Within a couple of weeks, new violet fungus mushrooms will grow from the rotting mound of sustenance. Often this results in uh, too many violet fungi in one area, and consequently, many of the fungi will then up and migrate to another area to form new colonies. Usually they um, seek out places that have water sources, because where there's water, there's more life taking along the shrieker spores uh, for the ride. So yeah, they tend to spore together. Generally, violet fungi have enough food and are quite docile and content where they are. However, if the food is absent for a long time, it may begin to wander in search of a better spot. Also, if the spot is just too dry and too cold, it will retreat to a more hospitable place. Once they detect prey, they'll strike out with those necrotic tentacles which secrete a blend of enzymes that break down tissue um, particularly quickly and have a 10-foot whipping reach, uh, although they're not capable, as far as I know, of grappling. Those who have been struck by the tentacles of violet fungus refer to it as having been stung by one, kind of like a cave version of a jellyfish. Um, and people who have lived in close proximity to, to the uh, violet fungus for some time usually have one or two scars um, from where these things have burned them. No part of the violet fungus is safe to eat, um, unless the character is totally immune to all poisons and is desperately hungry, uh, because they're bloody awful. 
I'm curious though, have you used fungus in your games in an innovative and unusual way? I'd love to hear your tales of fungus daring do in your campaign adventures in the comment section down below. Just a reminder, if you've not subscribed already, feel free to do so and be sure to hit that notification bell as I upload from the other side of the world sometime in your future. For access to all of the scripts and one week advanced access to these videos, consider becoming a patron on the channel on Patreon for a minimum of just $1 per month. Join the community on our Discord server. Come say hi when I pop in there occasionally. Also, if you want to pick up a new video game at a significant daily discount and uh, keep checking back on there every day for a new game every single day with uh, quite often a significant discount, help me out in the process so I get a little kickback from those proceeds. And check out the daily deal on Chrono. So the Chrono is the place that sells those games. Link down below in the video description text. Also, there's a link to the one bit of merch that I have at the moment, which is the Mighty Glue Stick logo on a mug. Because as we all know, I love my coffee. As always, thanks for listening. I'll be back with more for you again very soon.